You're listening to the worldwide broadcast of the Hour of the Time. I'm your host, William Cooper. Tonight, for those of you who have written and called telling me that there has never been any plans for a one-world government, I'm going to shake your tree tonight. You are absolutely wrong. You are living in fantasy land, and tonight you are going to hear the proof, proof that you can look up and dig out for yourself, and you're only going to get a very tiny, small minority portion of the truth that exists in the world to prove that not only are there plans for one world government, but these plans began before the United Nations was ever even created. Don't go away, folks. You're going to be blown right out of your mind by tonight's broadcast. The Philadelphia Bulletin, October the 22nd, 1942. Headline, Aim for Allies, Smash Axis, and Establish World Government. The article, an all-out allied offensive against the Axis unity in post-war aims should be followed by international cooperation and a world government. These are the essential findings in the 11th Roundtable on Prospects for 1943 in the October Free World magazine. Participating in the discussion were Ernest Minock Patterson of Philadelphia, President of the American Academy of Social and Political Science and author of The Economic Basis of Peace and America, World Leader or World Led. Sir Norman Angell, winner of the Nobel Peace Prize. General Julius Deutsch, former Australian Minister of War and prominent international labor leader. Max Lerner, professor of political science at Williams College and contributing editor of The New Republic, whose most recent books are The New Federalist and Ideas for the Ice Age. Eugene Lyons, editor of the American Mercury and author of Assignment in Utopia. Max Werner, military analyst and author of The Great Offensive, The Strategy of Coalition Warfare. And William Ziff, author of The Coming Battle of Germany, which was published in the Bulletin in Serial Form. The discussion over which Louis Dolovit presided came to these conclusions. Number one, the United Nations must launch an all-out offensive against the Axis. In this total war, a division of functions among the different nations is imperative. Equally important is the emphasis on the use of air power, including the bombing of German industrial centers, railway communications, and supply bases. Two, the total war imposes in the political field the need for greater unity in the planning and expression of post-war aims. Three, although some progress has been made in enlightening public opinion in the democracies concerning present issues and the problems of a future world order, a concerted effort to educate the masses regarding the interdependence of nations and the need for international cooperation is indispensable to the winning of the war and to the establishment of permanent peace for the creation of the machinery of a world government in which the present United Nations will serve as a nucleus is a necessary task of the present in order to prepare in time the foundations for a future world order. Ladies and gentlemen, that article, as I stated at the beginning, appeared in the Philadelphia Bulletin, October the 22nd, 1942, before the United Nations was ever formed in the public eye, it had been formed in secret. This is an admission of that fact and of a plan for a new world order. Ladies and gentlemen, they talked about the interdependence of nations, something that was just not too long ago, put forth in this country. And there's much, much more. Now, for you bigots and you skeptics and you stupid people out there and the sheeple who have a chance, and the sheeple are the only ones who do have a chance, besides the ones who have already awakened and understand what's happening, you'd better pay close attention to me and you had better stop being stupid. Wake up. Wake up, ladies and gentlemen. The Sunday News, New York, June 18th, 1944, headline, FDR Peace Blueprints Styled on Professor's Plan by Ted Lewis, Dateline, Washington, D.C., June 17th. Major elements, 
of President Roosevelt's plan for a post-war security organization it developed today are on the model of a community of states, blueprint drafted under the auspices of the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace by 200 prominent Americans and Canadians, 78 of them college presidents or professors. Points of similarity in the main design as revealed by Roosevelt Thursday and by the Carnegie Peace Group March 27th included 1. A council composed of the big four powers at the start. 2. A general assembly of all nations. 3. Use of force to keep the peace by joint action of interested nations rather than through the World Organization. And 4. An international court of justice to deal with legal disputes. Both plans seek to allay opposition by insisting that cooperation to keep the peace would not violate a nation's sovereignty. The Carnegie proposal, however, declaring that all nations have legal duties under international law. The President's plan is admittedly in an unfinished state as to detail. He has said, however, that under it the sovereignty and integrity of the United States would not be impaired. It was worked out in conferences at which various plans of organizations such as the Carnegie Group were considered. Meanwhile, it developed that no set time has been agreed on for preliminary discussions of the American plan, hereby representatives of China, Russia, and Britain, the conferees, who will submit any counterproposals, are expected to be the foreign secretaries of the Big Four, Hull for the United States, Eden for Britain, Molotov for Russia, and T.V. Sung for China. Ladies and gentlemen, again, I remind you that appeared in the Sunday News, New York City, June 18, 1944. When you gonna wake up? When you gonna wake up? I love that song. Dateline, Dateline, Thursday, August 26, 1943, Chicago, Daily Tribune, the world's greatest newspaper, founded June 10, 1849. Again, the dateline, Thursday, August 26, 1943, Mr. Rhodes' Agents. Cecil Rhodes was a great Englishman, and like all great Englishmen, completely devoted to his own nation. He made the extension of the British Dominion in South Africa his life work. He believed without reservation in the British Empire as a power for good in the world, and in his remarkable will made provision for the use of his fortune to extend that influence. The Rhodes Scholarships have been a tremendous asset to the British Empire. Their value to the nations on whose people they have been bestowed has been dubious, a result with which Mr. Rhodes was naturally unconcerned. Representative J.W. Fulbright of Arkansas is the author of the slick-termed resolution seeking to pledge Congress in advance to a world super-government. He is a Rhodes Scholar. Representative Robert Hale of Maine is touring the country making speeches on behalf of the similar Ball, Burn, and Hatch resolution pending in the Senate. He is another Rhodes Scholar. Such Rhodes Scholars as Herbert Agar and Elmer Davis were in the forefront of the campaign to drag us into the war before Pearl Harbor. No Rhodes Scholar can escape the suspicion of being consciously or unconsciously an alien agent. All of them have been subsidized by foreign money. The fact that they boast of the subsidy they received rather than attempt to conceal it is not important. The scholarships were created to corrupt Americans, and it is obvious that they have been successful in part. To what extent, we do not know. All of the Rhodes Scholars in this country should declare themselves, if they still possess loyalty to the American Union, they should state the fact and make it apparent by their public acts. If their allegiance has been subverted, they should have the public decency to admit it and present themselves honestly as British agents and not as American citizens. Ladies and gentlemen, President William Clinton is a Rhodes Scholar. Again, this article appeared in the Chicago Daily Tribune, Thursday, August 26, 1943. Great Britain is now drowning in Marxism and Socialism. William Clinton and his wife Hillary are Marxists and Socialists. If you don't believe that statement, you just keep an eye on the future, the future course of this nation. Wake up, sheeple. Wake up. And if you've got somebody stupid sitting next to you, get a two-by-four and hit them upside the head. Wake them up also. At least get their attention. 
Chicago Daily Tribune, Dateline, Monday, September 27, 1943. Headline, Finger Print Them. When the American Rhodes Scholars educated in England with the money of an Englishman who intended that they should help to bring the United States back into the British Empire, were shown in the Tribune to be occupying high positions in our federal government, the Tribune offered them space in its columns to absolve themselves of the suspicion of seditious activity. The Tribune named 49 Rhodes Scholars and 14 other Oxonians in the federal payroll and identified their jobs, most of them policy-making positions. It told how Cecil John Rhodes, the great diamond and gold mine proprietor and British imperialist, conspired to launch a political revolution. His Oxford scholarships were intended to establish a secret society aimed at extending British rule throughout the world and particularly over the United States. Not one of these imperialist trained Americans who invited suspicion by accepting the Rhodes gratuity has offered to affirm his loyalty to the United States or to deny devotion to Rhodes imperialism. Their silence will not allay suspicion, but can only serve to heighten it. The Rhodes Scholars, who are supporting various international schemes, insist that the United States, as a sovereign nation, must cease to exist. They maintain that through pact and alliance it must become the tail of the British kite in any post-war world acceptable to them. The success of the Oxford conspiracy in America must be a source of immense satisfaction to Cecil Rhodes's countrymen. Any man who chose to have himself educated in a foreign country, no matter what country it was, must fall under suspicion, along with the Rhodes Scholars. He deliberately turned his back on the advantage of an American education to be schooled as a foreigner. It is inevitable that the alien viewpoints gained through study in foreign countries during impressionable years will be retained. With the Oxford conspiracy before the nation as an example, it would be wise now for Congress to pass a law requiring all foreign educated Americans to register with the federal government, and it might be a good idea to have them fingerprinted as well. Again, I remind you that appeared in the Chicago Daily Tribune, founded June 18th, or June 10th, I should say, 1849, and this appeared Monday, September 27th, 1943. Ladies and gentlemen, are you beginning to understand a little bit of something here? Are you still lost deep, deep, deep down in slumberland? In any case, I shall continue once I get this ream of paper here under control. Philadelphia Evening Bulletin, Dateline, June 26, 1941. Let me say that again, folks. Philadelphia Evening Bulletin, Dateline June 26, 1941. Opinions and Reviews. United States of the World is Suggested as Cure for International Chaos. Carlton W. Woodring of Northampton has introduced a resolution in the Senate and House of Representatives of Pennsylvania which may become historic. It is in two parts. The preamble explains the cause of the breakdown of civilization and the mounting fury of wars in a manner so simple and so clear that it deserves the earnest consideration of every citizen. The absence of government, it says, is anarchy and chaos, which are the antithesis of civilization, and under a condition of anarchy and chaos, the inalienable rights of mankind enumerated in the, in the Declaration of Independence cannot survive. Why is it no one can read the Declaration of Independence? It clearly says unalienable rights. I continue. It declares that within the sphere of international society there is no government but a condition of anarchy and chaos that incessant warfare is the inevitable handmaiden of anarchy among sovereign nations, and that the rapid development of modern science has brought into being new weapons of warfare and new machines of destruction with powers of devastation so extensive and frightful that unless there ensues a corresponding political development establishing international government in place of international anarchy and properly restraining and directing the uses of scientific knowledge, human liberty 
and the inalienable rights of mankind, the democratic way of life, and civilization itself must soon be reduced to the dimensions of an episode in history. Part 2 proposes a remedy for this perpetual free fight. It calls upon the General Assembly of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania to express its desire that the President and Congress commit the United States in principle to the creation of a Federal Union of Nations to be known as the United States of the World, and to be based upon a written Constitution as similar as may be to the Constitution of the United States that the jurisdiction of the United Nations shall be limited to maintaining the peace and security of the members and citizens, to regulating trade and commerce among the nations, and to governing in the sphere of what has hitherto been known as international law, and that to these ends the United Nations shall maintain its own armies and navies, and shall be endowed with the necessary incidents of sovereign power. The proposal goes on to suggest this world government should have the same legislative, judicial, and executive setup as the United States now has, together with the safeguards of human liberty as are provided in the American Constitution. Now, before I go on, folks, I want to draw your attention to something. You see, the United Nations already existed at this time in secret. He proposes... He proposes a federal union of nations to be known as the United States of the world, and in the very next paragraph begins to call it what it really already was called in secret, the United Nations, and he calls it the United Nations for the rest of this article, which I remind you was published June 26, 1941. Now, I continue. It suggests a preliminary membership of the United States, Great Britain, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the Union of South Africa, and the further admission of any nations whose standards of enlightenment, civil, and religious liberty are substantially the same as in this nucleus. The people have been clamoring for some answer to the eternal economic wrangles and bloodthirsty threats and devastating aggressions besides a future devoted exclusively to universal military conscription and feverish and impoverishing manufacture of a wilderness of armaments. Many theories and suggestions have been made by societies, universities, and individuals. But this resolution opens the way for political action and solution and provides a practical vehicle for public participation, understanding, and debate. As a start, this resolution has two great virtues. Its diagnosis of the problem is accurate and short. The solution follows in detail the principles and beliefs of the American people in the fields of religion, sociology, and economics, and it follows the pattern of political organization of the Union invented here in Philadelphia to remedy a similar anarchy on a smaller scale. Folks, I hope you're beginning to put two and two together, just in case you haven't done that yet. Philadelphia Bulletin, May the 5th, 1942. Again, Philadelphia Bulletin, May the 5th, 1942. Headline, Plan for Federation of World Definitely Underway in United States. Public opinion in the United States has swung with increasing insistence to support of this idea of our countries taking the lead in forming some kind of world organization to keep the peace and further the primary freedom among all peoples. In general terms, this purpose is accepted by all the Allied nations fighting the Axis. They all endorsed the Atlantic Charter. It is the cornerstone of the administration's policy. It recently was adopted in principle by the Republican Party at the instance of Wendell Wilkie. The Gallup poll shows an ever-increasing majority of citizens favor it. The multiplying groups and associations studying the subject all recommend that we join some form of international organization for this purpose. The general intent and necessity are recognized. The great problem ahead of us is how to start towards the practical building of such an organization, how to formulate some specific plan that will be acceptable to our citizens and also acceptable to a working majority of other nationalities. This requires political action as well as academic wisdom and popular approval. 
The lead, indefinite political action, was taken last year by North Carolina. The General Assembly of that state adopted a resolution requesting the senators and the members of the House of Representatives in Congress from the state of North Carolina to introduce and secure the passage in the Congress of a resolution committing the United States to the acceptance of the principle of a federation of the world and requesting the President of the United States to call an international convention to formulate a constitution for the federation of the world, which shall be submitted to each state for ratification. On May the 1st, the General Assembly of New Jersey, with the concurrence of the Senate, urged upon Congress a somewhat similar resolution in favor of World Federation. The peroration of the preamble may well turn out to be the accepted formula of American thought. It says, quote, that all human beings are citizens of this world community which requires laws and not treaties for its government that the present conflict will determine the survival of free institutions throughout the world, and that it is incumbent upon this generation, as one of the declared objectives of the current struggle, to federate the nations in order to make secure and thereafter unchallenged freedom for all people everywhere, and in order to impart to those who are called to give their lives and fortunes from the, for the triumph of democracy the positive assurances of the incorruptible utility of their sacrifice, unquote. Now, one question that I would ask, folks, and I'm not reading from the article now, is if that's the case. As we draw closer to one world government, why is it that we only lose freedoms and nothing has been assured to us? In fact, in fact, the only thing that we are assured is assured slavery. I continue. This political movement from the people through the state's governments to the National Congress was started by Robert L. Humber, a private citizen in North Carolina. It has now gained the momentum of endorsement by communities in North and South, Democratic and Republican. It is no longer an idea. It is an institution. With this hard-won background and recognition, the scheme now is to tackle Pennsylvania and the larger states. The hope and expectation is that this simple plan, which commits us to nothing except a willingness to discuss cooperation with all peoples, will converge from the grassroots upon Washington, that it will become the voice of the people. What a despicable lie. The United Nations was never the will of the people. The people were never behind it, and that's the reason it never has had any clout until now and the people are still not behind it. So what is happening? Subterfuge, subversion, all of this is being done in secret, ladies and gentlemen. And when they found out that the public would not and was not behind it, the National Security Act was passed, the Central Intelligence Agency was formed, all this done by a Freemason of the 33rd degree, whose motto is Ordo Ab Teo, Harry Truman, all of this was created to bring about in secret the dissolution of the sovereignty of this nation and all other nation states of the world in order to bring about one world government. Now, I know there's a lot of you out there shaking your head, and even in light of what you've just heard, you're saying Bill Cooper's crazy. He's just another conspiracy nut. Those of you who have been listening to this program since its inception, I have given you hour after hour after hour after hour after hour of real illumination, not the phony false illumination that you get in these mystery schools and these secret societies. For I know many 32nd degree Freemasons of the Scottish Rite and Knights Templar 7th degree of the York Rite whom I've asked point blank. You've reached the top, the pinnacle, the highest degree of your respective organizations. Tell me, what profound truths have you learned? And they look at me with this blank look on their face because they haven't learned any. I say, what tremendous, momentous, 
unbelievably important secrets have you learned? And again, I get the same blank stare because they haven't learned any. But they have been a part of an organization that is bringing about the one world totalitarian socialist government. It's time to take our break, folks. Don't go away, because I've got a lot more here to read to you, proof that you can go dig out yourself and look at holding your very own hands for confirmation. I'll be right back after this very short pause. Bucks County Courier Times, Bucks County, Pennsylvania. Bucks County Courier Times, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, Sunday, looks like January the 11th, the date is uh, kind of blurred on this copy, looks like Sunday, January the 11th, 1976, listen to this folks, January the 11th, 1976, headline, world government will be here by 2000, let me repeat that in case you are suffering from some ear disease. World government will be here by 2000. I now read from the article. There is no longer a question of whether or not there will be a world government by the year 2000. The questions are how it will come into being. Cataclysm, drift, more or less rational design, and whether it will be totalitarian, benign, or participatory. The probabilities as being in that order. Since the so-called age of discovery, a Eurocentric concept which sorely needs modification in this global community, three major revolutions have propelled humankind towards global community and now towards global governance egalitarianism, the technological and scientific revolution, and the closely allied economic and interdependent revolution. These three revolutions have converged to produce five global problems, war, poverty, social injustice, ecological instability, and alienation, or the identity crisis. I believe these problems are closely interrelated and that solutions in one area have impacts on the other four areas. These remarks are based on the premise that it is necessary to accept seriously the reality of the term, quote, the global village, unquote. The fact that the overwhelming majority of humankind understands for the first time in history that human society encompasses the entire globe is a phenomenon equivalent to humankind's understanding that the globe is round rather than flat and that the earth revolves around the sun. In many ways, what we are passing through is as great as the Copernican Revolution. If you think that only a few hundred years ago there were less than one billion people on the face of the globe, some 50% not even knowing about the globe or knowing that other people existed on it, and today there are four billion people, all with that understanding, you can appreciate the enormously dramatic impact this is having on our images and attitudes with regard to authority structures at the domestic and global levels. I believe that the most likely governance by the end of the century, compelled by a series of crises from the arms races and outbreaks of violence, the food, population, and environment imbalances, as well as large-scale serious injustices, will be oligarchic and highly repressive. Many of the third world societies will have military governments, and there is reason to believe even Western liberal societies will face a period of strong conformity pressures such as existed in the United States during the McCarthy period in the 1950s. New institution needed. It is for that reason that I believe that thoughtful and responsible individuals throughout the world need to form a social movement to provide for the participation of ordinary people in creating new kinds of global institutions. Most individuals consider the development of global institutions either as politically unfeasible or, what is worse, politically undesirable. There is the widespread feeling that, given the diversity of cultures, ideologies, and values, we lack the global community on which such institutions could be founded. 
and I'm not reading from the article now, folks. I just want to tell this guy and everybody out there that that's totally wrong. You see, I have no problem with a one-world government at all. If the one-world government is based upon our Constitution and our Bill of Rights and individual creator-endowed rights are protected under this so-called world government, I, as well as anyone who has any brains or who is halfway intelligent in this world, knows that world government is an eventuality that we cannot dodge. And sooner or later, sooner or later, folks, it's going to happen. But it's not going to happen as long as I'm alive by subterfuge and lies and deceit and manipulation, getting us to believe that it's going to protect our creator-endowed rights, when in fact they have no intentions of doing that. They have every intention of enslaving the human race. But they talk in this double-speak, double-talk language, which most of the people readily fall into and fall for. Let me now continue with this article. However, people who are familiar with our own society and its makeup in the early 18th century, as well as with such diverse and variegated societies as India and China, will understand that there is as much interaction in community sentiment at the global level today as existed in those communities. This, with the combination of the crises I have mentioned, has compelled us in the direction of global governance. The problem is not that global institutions will not be politically feasible, but that they will be undemocratic. In my view, global institutions would be a radical act in the best sense of that term in establishing guidelines for policymakers throughout the globe in the field of arms, commodities, population, and environment. We would undoubtedly be freeing and maximizing the sovereignty of individuals. It is under the threat of hostile and foreign powers that policy elites are able to introduce stringent conformity and authoritarian police methods in their own states. More gobbledygook, double talk, baloney. Because that's not true, folks. In this country, they're doing it just on the guise of getting crime and drugs off the streets in this country. You see, all they need is an enemy. It doesn't have to be a foreign power. Just any enemy to convince the sheeple that they need more control. Back to the article. Global institutions which clearly delineate the capacities of nation-states to arm, to resolve disputes in a peaceful manner, to determine how the scarce resources of a finite globe could be used, could change dramatically the control individuals would have in their own lives. I believe creative participation in the establishment of global institutions will minimize the risks of catastrophe and totalitarianism, and that the continuation of the nation-state system on its present course increases the possibility of both. The details of the global institution can be spelled out only in principle, complete and general disarmament, some kind of effective peacekeeping, third-party resolution of political disputes, some form of global taxation, standards for preserving the environment and making certain there is access for ordinary individuals and smaller groups to participate in important political and social decisions. It is clear that in order to achieve these principles, by the end of the century, we need a transition strategy. That means setting up concrete political goals for a global movement. I would suggest the following for the next five to ten years, not necessarily in the order or priorities. Change the life expectancy of the third world inhabitants from its present 45 to 50 years to the 70 to 75 years that individuals born in the industrialized societies enjoy. This probably means a greatly expanded World Health Organization, World Food Reserves, perhaps the right to food for all individuals and the organization of medicine in much different ways than we now conceive of it. In other words, folks, rampant total socialism, maybe even falling into communism. And to continue, eliminate the practice of apartheid and discrimination based on race as a national, national policy are in fact criminal. They should be subject to criminal laws. 
developed modestly sized world police forces with the capacity to intervene in civil wars of the size and ferocity that have occurred in Indonesia, Somalia, Bangladesh, Nigeria, Burundi. To deal with a cross-boundary incursion is also well within world community potential, and so is the ability to move from the present $250 billion a year being spent annually on arms to about $25 billion a year by 1990, graduating the decrease over this period of time. Eliminate war as an institution, recognizing that direct violence produces the loss of 150,000 lives on the battlefield annually, with another 300 to 450,000 attributable to that violence. I would hope that a reasonable target would be to reduce those figures to 15,000 by the beginning of the 1990s. Initiate compulsory jurisdiction before courts by the mid-80s. The establishment of an ocean regime for the benefit of humanity is now being debated as the various sea law conferences and should receive the highest priority in the next few years. Finally, within the present context, initiate serious discussion on the new international economic order. This provides not only challenge, but the opportunity to articulate principles and promote programs which will have a direct impact on the material conditions and quality of life of every human being in the world. And it talks about the author down here. Saul Mindelowitz is a professor of international law at Rutgers University and president of the Institute for World Order. Again, again, the headline was World Government Will Be Here by 2000. <laughs> that was taken from the Bucks County Courier Times, Pennsylvania, January 11, 1976. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you understand the implications of everything that I'm reading here. I can show you that there has been a pattern of planning and propaganda aimed toward the general populace to bring this about. And in fact, the United States was formed, uh, excuse me, the United Nations was formed actually in secret long before it was formed in the public realm by the admission of all of these articles that I've been reading you today or tonight, I should say. Now I'm looking at something here. We have located a map, a map, ladies and gentlemen. This map was actually <coughs> drawn up in 1942. And on this map, it has the exact geographic boundaries and the new nations that were formed post-World War II. In 1942, long before this was supposedly agreed to or drawn up or anything else. And on this map, here's what it says. Outline of post-war New World Map as the United States of America, with the cooperation of the democracies of Latin America, the British Commonwealth of Nations, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, assumes world leadership for the establishment of a new world moral order for permanent peace, freedom, justice, security, and world reconstruction. And on this map, ladies and gentlemen, is the boundaries of the new Soviet Union post-World War II with all the Eastern Bloc nations. Also is a section with the exact boundaries that the state of Israel was later to have. And on this map, it calls it Hebrew land. And I'm going to read you as much of this as I can, but I'm not going to have time to finish the whole thing but you're going to get as much as I have time to give you. Legend on outline of post-war New World map as the United States of America with the cooperation of the democracies of Latin America, the British Commonwealth of Nations, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics assumes world leadership for the establishment of a new world moral order for permanent peace, freedom, justice, security, and world reconstruction. Our policy shall be this. One, we, the United States of America, in cooperation with our allies for reasons of our national safety and in the interests of international morality, are determined to crush and completely destroy the military power of the Axis aggressors and their satellites regardless of cost, effort, and time necessary to accomplish this task. 
two, the old world order of colonial oppression, exploitation of the of uh, uh, dominions, rival imperialisms, and mercenary balance of power, diplomacy, of majesties, dictators, privileged minorities, plutocratic monopolists, and similar social parasites, the corrupted order responsible for the present world cataclysm, endangering our national safety and peaceful progress, shall never rise again. You'll have to excuse me if I stumble over some of these words, folks. This is an old document, and some, some of these words are difficult to read. Again, this map was drawn up and made in 1942. Number three, world moral order for permanent peace and freedom shall be established at the successful conclusion of the present war. Four, for reasons of history, economic structure, favorable geography, and the welfare of mankind, the United States of America must altruistically assume the leadership of the newly established democratic world order. Five, to reduce the burden and criminal waste of armaments, expenditures everywhere in the world, the United States of America, with the cooperation of Latin America, the British Commonwealth of Nations, and the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, shall undertake to guarantee peace to the nations which will be permanently disarmed and demilitarized after the conclusion of the present war. Now, in reality, this didn't happen, folks, because mainly the people of the United States of America screamed no. You see, they weren't asleep back then, like you all are now. So they had to foment the guise of the Cold War to create the conditions whereby they could bring it about. And that's the whole reason for the Cold War, ladies and gentlemen. So that our tax dollars could fund the formation of the one world government and the military might and technology which could not be resisted by anyone. Number six. In order to be able, in fulfillment of our obligations, to effectively prevent the possibility of a recurrence or another world cataclysm, in the, the invincibility of the United States of America as a military, naval, and air power shall be the major prerequisite. Seven, for realistic considerations of strategy and our invulnerability, it is imperative that the United States of America shall obtain relinquishment of controls of their possessions from all foreign powers in the entire Western Hemisphere, its surrounding waters and strategic island outposts as outlined on the accompanying map. That's what's occurring now, folks, with this gap in NAFTA. You watch. Number eight, for considerations of hemispheric defense and in the spirit of tradition of the new Monroe Doctrine of hemispheric solidarity and the good neighbor policy, the United States of America, with the consent of the Latin American republics, shall obtain control and protectorate rights of the relinquished territories. 21. The areas known as Saudi Arabia, Syria, Lebanon, Iraq, Hejaz, Yemen, Aden, and Oman shall be unified as a demilitarized union of Arabian Federated Republics. Well, we know that Arab fundamentalism would not allow that to happen. And that's as far as I could get. There are actually 41 clauses to this, ladies and gentlemen. We can't make this available right now, but maybe sometime in the future we will be able to. And thus we are nearing the end of this broadcast. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, meet in Washington, D.C., September the 29th, 9 a.m. on the Capitol steps. Support, support this move to abolish the illegal and unconstitutional Federal Reserve and the criminal internal revenue system. Good night, folks, and God bless each and every single one of you.